All right, I kind of think everybody's back more or less. Is that right? I can't tell for sure, but it kind of looks like everybody's back. And I think I said 1110, so uh, it's 1109. Um, why don't we sort of get started slowly? Uh, well, I mean, we'll just get started. Uh, and I want to talk about um, the problem of induction. Uh, so we've been describing induction as a behavior. Uh, we've been describing a little bit about what induction is like, uh, the situations that we find ourselves using induction, and some of the mistakes that we make. Uh, and we've also suggested that it's unavoidable, right? That we are just uh, inclined to make inductions. Uh, we're inclined uh, to take what we know about the world, what we observe now and what we've observed in the past, and to make predictions. And that most of the time those predictions are reasonable. Uh, some of the times the predictions are wrong. And some of the times the predictions are wrong, but we don't notice because we're not paying attention. Uh, so we have a tendency to make inductions, but let's talk about why that's a problem. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, why we do it anyway. Again, I guess I have to go back here. So the problem of induction is one that was, sorry. I can get myself back together here. All right, the problem of induction was originally defined by uh, the philosopher David Hume. So we'll get, uh, we'll describe a little bit about his problem. Uh, and then I wanna talk about some of the other modifications to this problem and how we can resolve the problem uh, by using an idea known as categorical induction. Uh, in other words, the idea that we, we form and use concepts in our thinking and that that's how and why we carry out inductive inferences even though they don't seem to be logically uh, justified. All of these examples identify induction as a natural byproduct of how the brain and mind work. We have a natural tendency to generalize the stimuli. This is something that's observed in organisms uh, from the simplest uh, biological organisms uh, to uh, non-human primates, to us as human primates, uh, and it's observed in non-human uh, entities, machines, for example, make inductions. It's a natural byproduct of organization. So David Hume uh, is associated with the uh, Enlightenment era, uh, a Scottish philosopher, died in Edinburgh in 1776, uh, has become something of a hero to academic philosophers, I guess, according to this article. In 2009, he won first place in a large, I didn't know there was a prize for this, uh, first place in a large international poll of professors and graduate students who were asked to name the dead thinker with whom they most identified. Uh, so much of our common uh, philosophical approaches to things, uh, in, especially in the Western philosophical tradition, uh, align with things uh, that Hume uh, was interested in. A lot of our academic uh, approach and scientific approach to discovery aligns with Hume's approach. Uh, lots of other things that Hume uh, worked on and uh, thought about and wrote about that may not necessarily be relevant, but the idea of induction uh, certainly is. Um, I wanna talk about two problems he had. He had a problem and a solution uh, for induction. And the solution is not a very good one uh, until we think about how induction works as a byproduct of how the mind is organized. So we're gonna to refer to this as Hume's negative thesis and his positive thesis. And just to remember the negative thesis is Hume saying induction cannot work. So he's being negative about it. So that's a good way to remember it. Uh, his positive thesis is to say, actually induction does work, here's why. Uh, so the negative one is him being negative, the positive one is him being positive. So when I ask, on an exam, uh, is this an example of which one? Uh, the positive one is, here's how it works. The negative one is all this description for why it doesn't work. Hume's negative thesis. We cannot hold that nature will continue to be as uniform as it has been in the past, as this is using the very sort of reasoning, induction, that is under question 
it would be circular reasoning. So do you all, under, you, you're probably familiar with the idea of circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is using something to explain itself, right? So it doesn't arrive at additional information to be able to explain the process. What Hume's complaint is that suppose we made good predictions in the past using an inductive process. In other words, yesterday, uh, you made a correct inference about what you were gonna find inside the Hubbard squash. Uh, and you say, well, you know, I, I made a good induction yesterday. I used what I know about the world and my knowledge to make a prediction. And then that prediction turned out to be true. So my inductions actually were good uh, in the past. And his claim is that, well, why can we, why would we assume that just because induction worked in the past, why would it work in the future? Uh, just because the relationship between Hubbard squashes was observed in the past, and just because prior connections between different kinds of exteriors of squashes and interiors of squashes seemed consistent in the past, maybe it was just by chance. Maybe there is no relationship, and for two years you've been observing what seems like a correlation between squash outside and inside, and going forward, that relationship breaks down. In other words, just because induction worked in the past, why would you assume that it works in the future? Because by saying that, you're saying, I take my experiences in the past and I make a generalization. That's an induction, right? So you're saying induction worked in the past and I'm going to predict, therefore induce, that it will work in the future. And he's suggesting that is a circular process. We can't assume that induction that our inductions that were good in the past will be good in the future, because that's using induction to assume that those inductions that were good in the past will also be good in the future. In other words, it's using the past to predict the future, which is what induction is. And so his claim is that there's not a really good logical way to explain induction, because in order to explain our tendency to use inductions, we have to use inductions to assume that we will use induction in the future, the same way we use it in the past. And that just can't work. The only way around it for Hume is to say that, you know what, There's, we'd have no other choice. Uh, and he's kind of hinting at what we're gonna suggest later, which is it's the organization of information in the mind that lends itself to induction. He says, nature by absolute necessity has determined us to judge as well as to breathe and feel. In other words, we have a natural tendency to make inductions, whether or not it makes sense logically. We just can't help ourselves. We see something and we make predictions. And we don't know if they're gonna be good predictions in the future, uh, but we just do it anyway. So he's suggesting that we don't need to explain induction logically because it's something that we do naturally. We have no choice by absolute necessity. Uh, nature has determined us uh, to judge. Uh, and this seems to be true. This lines up with what we know about uh, stimulus response uh, behavior in other organisms. This lines up with what we know about classical conditioning in other organisms. So it lines up with what we know about organisms that wouldn't really think about uh, induction or that wouldn't really comprehend uh, Hume's problems. They would still behave in this generalization pattern. So his negative thesis, you can't use the past to predict the future just because you use the past to predict the future in the past doesn't mean you can use the future past to predict the future in the future, right? Um, I just started, I realized that sounds like a SpongeBob episode. Uh, so you can't use the future to predict the past in the future, um, but we do it anyway. Uh, and we're gonna do it in a systematic way by virtue of categories and concepts. It gets more complicated though, because in the 20th century, a philosopher who's one of my favorite, Nelson Goodman, uh, brought the idea back up. People kind of were satisfied for a while with Hume's positive thesis, like, okay, fine, we make inductions. It just seems to be how the world works. That's great. Uh, Hume was fine with that, but Goodman was not. Nelson Goodman, 20th century philosopher, uh, says, okay, fine. Suppose we have this natural tendency, but Given this natural tendency, that implies that there are lots of other things that could be simultaneously true as we're trying to make a specific induction. How do we decide which one is the right one? How do we usually get the right answer? And here's how he framed it. So suppose uh, in your life, you have seen emeralds to be green. 
Uh, suppose you are examining emeralds, uh, and every time you see an emerald, uh, it's a green emerald. That's, that's an observation, right? And you collect that information. If you're doing uh, bottom-up processing, if you're doing uh, uh, specific to general type of processing, the way we suggested in, uh, inductive inferencing is, you're collecting evidence. Lots of green emeralds. In fact, every emerald you've ever seen in your life is a green emerald. And you can then conclude and make a statement. You can create a belief about the world uh, that helps to guide your inferences, uh, just like we might create a belief about the world depending on how geese behave this time of year or what it means to have a flag on your truck uh, or what it means to be active in the feminist movement uh, or any of those other examples we gave. Uh, we also have a statement here about emeralds. They just happen to be green. It's a property of an emerald, right? And I know that if I reach into this bag of emeralds without looking, I'm guaranteed to pull out a green thing because emeralds are green. Every emerald I've ever seen in my life is green. Goodman says, fine, that is a property. Green is a property of emeralds. However, at the same time, consider the property of gru, which is a made up word. Uh, and Goodman says, gru is the property, all emeralds thus seen and green, and all seen, not seen and blue. In other words, at the moment of decision, uh, and this is, a, you know, this is a, a quantum problem, at the moment of decision, uh, before you see that emerald, these can both be simultaneously true, right? It is true that all emeralds are green, but it could also at the same time be equally true that all emeralds thus seen so far are green, and the ones you have not yet seen will be blue, and you will pull out a blue emerald. Uh, both of them are simultaneously true statements. So the Schrodinger's cat. Yes. Yeah, so the, the statement was that this is sort of a, you're familiar with the Schrodinger's cat, right? You won't be able to know if the cat is alive or dead until you observe it and the process of observing it uh, could create a situation where the cat could be dead or alive. You won't know uh, until you've opened the box, right? Uh, so Gru, the Gru emerald uh, is a way of making that point uh, sort of universally true. If you're trying to make an inference, uh, about anything, there's another range of possibilities that could simultaneously be true. And most people, and because Goodman is a philosopher, this is a, uh, this is a thought experiment, right? This is not going to happen. <laughs> we know it's not going to happen. We know we're not going to have this situation where all your life you've been exposed to green emeralds, but suddenly, uh, for whatever reason, now they're all blue, right? That doesn't happen. Uh, but Goodman's case is that how do we know it's not going to happen? And you can see how this is a parallel to uh, Hume's problem of induction. Just because everything was green in the past and we think that emeralds are green, what do we do about this other property, which technically speaking is true? Uh, we just won't know. And it's true each time, right? Each time I pull out an emerald and it's green, gru is still true, right? Because the next one I haven't seen could be blue. And the next one I haven't seen could be blue. So how do we know? They're both true. They make opposite predictions about the next emerald you will examine, but no one in their right mind thinks this one is true. Even though they are both actually true, no one agrees with the prediction of the Gru uh, premise. We agree with the prediction of the Green premise. So Goodman says, we all agree. This is ridiculous. This is not realistic. We know that emeralds are green, uh, but how do we know that emeralds are green? How do we know that this is not something we're gonna pay attention to, given that we can all agree that it is actually true. So he comes up with several examples. Um, actually, this is just, I should have just moved on to this one. This is our uh, graphic example of the Gru emeralds, right? Everything is green, but Gru means this state of affairs and green means this state of affairs. They're green for all time. This means they're green for some time and then they become blue. Uh, and at the moment of emerald examination, both are simultaneously true, but we only assume that one of them is true. Um, Goodman suggests that there are some reasons why, and one of them he refers to as entrenchment. Uh, his suggestion is that we make predictions based on what we think is culturally expected. In other words, a term, in order for us to assume that a term is something we can make an inference from, like all emeralds are green, 
it has to have a history of past use. It has to be culturally entrenched. It's something that we learn when we learn language. Uh, green is a property that we use to describe an entire class of things, both seen and unseen. So if we believe, or if we are told, or if we conclude that emeralds are green, uh, our idea of entrenchment is that it describes the entire class, that it doesn't describe a, a potential class that might change with time. We just don't use language that way. So Goodman's suggestion first is that we use language in a way that's culturally entrenched. Yes, green and grew are both true, but we're gonna go with green because green is a term that we've used in the past to describe an entire class of objects. And if we believe emeralds to be green, we assume that that applies to the entire class of objects, not just things we've seen up to this very moment in time and everything afterwards is a different color. Technically possible, but we're not gonna go with it because it's not how we use our language. And so we would not assume that that's a culturally entrenched, uh, linguistically entrenched uh, term. That's reason number one. So language use suggests that we apply terms like green to a category and not to a half category. He's giving us uh, evidence for why we behave uh, even though it is a problem. So he's, ident he's gonna identify the problem. This was published in a paper, I think maybe in the 1950s called the new riddle of induction. Actually, I think it was a new in the 1960s. So he identifies the problem as saying Hume was right and he's still right. Uh, this, pro this is still a problem for us. And here's other reasons why I think we still ignore it when we behave. Uh, so yes, he is suggesting that this is something we do uh, that's a little bit more refined than just saying nature has given us the tendency to judge. Uh, he's suggesting that we have terms and if we describe it, if a term describes a whole category, we assume that it describes a whole category. Um, uh, W.V. Quine, who was a philosopher around the same time, uh, suggested a further refinement. And he's, his suggestion was that culturally entrenched terms uh, like green emeralds uh, also describe a natural kind and that we have a tendency to believe the world is organized into concepts. And to organize into concepts means that we treat them as natural kinds. Two lectures ago, it seems like a long time ago, it was right before it was the lecture before the lecture before the break, we talked about concepts and categories and we described concepts as behavioral equivalence classes. In other words, a group of things that we know are individually distinct from each other, they're different things, but we treat them in the same way. Quine refers to this as a natural kind. Uh, and he suggests that Goodman's term entrenchment, we use things like green to refer to a kind, to refer to a group. And the assumption is that most everything in that category has that property and that it wouldn't be arbitrarily defined on uh, things that we've seen and not seen. Doesn't mean that that GRU property isn't true. It's just that we don't, we ignore it. Uh, because uh, it doesn't describe a natural kind. In other words, green emeralds form a kind via perceptual similarity. Uh, emeralds are green because we see them as green and we see them as green because of the properties and the makeups of the stone itself reflects green light in a certain way. Uh, so they are together because they look the same and because they are the same. And we assume that in order to call them emeralds, they have to be green. And there's lots of reasons why these things correlate. And they are a kind or a category, whereas GRU emeralds, despite the fact that that could be described as a true premise, is not a natural kind. If it turned out that tomorrow, all of the things that were composed of the same atomic structure as an emerald reflected back blue light, we would come up with a new term for emeralds, right? We would. Uh, describe them as being blue or green, right? It would no longer be a, a kind descriptor. Uh, so GRU is not a natural kind. It doesn't refer to a category of things the way green does. Um, and all animals, all organisms make use of this kind of similarity, uh, primitive features that we see. So uh, non-human uh, species, cats, for example, dogs, worms, uh, sim you know, simpler organisms treat things that are perceptually the same as deserving of the same response. So we have this natural tendency that we've inherited from lots of, you know, through evolution and lots of other animals, uh, lots of other uh, organisms share this property with us to make stimulus generalization. 
Uh, so Klein's solution to Hume's problem and later Goodman's riddle of induction uh, is induction has to be categorical. So we make our inductions based on concepts and categories, not just information itself. Uh, so the idea that there would be Gru emeralds makes no sense because that's not a category. That's not a group and that's not a natural kind. We don't have a tendency to describe groups like that uh, with a term that is temporally uh, distinct, that at some arbitrary time, the features will change, right? That's, it can happen, but we don't have a word for it. And we don't treat things uh, conceptually like that. So the term green is entrenched because it refers to a group, a category, or a concept. Reliable inductions come from categories, kinds, uh, and concepts. Another way of saying it is that apples and pears are a kind of thing. They are small handheld fruits. Uh, apples and maybe apple-sized red balls, although they might have the same shape and the same color, they don't form the same kind. So we wouldn't make the same inductions. I might cut open an apple and a pear and expect to see similar things on the inside, even though they're different fruits, because they're both fruits. I would cut open the apple and the red rubber ball and not expect to see the same thing, even if they had a greater perceptual similarity because I know they're not in the same category, right? So I'm not making the same kind of a uh, categorical induction. Quine's suggestion is induction is a categorical uh, process. Um, and as I said, what is a concept? It's a behavioral equivalence class. One of the kinds of behaviors we use and show with concepts most often are inductions. We predict what we can't see based on what we can see. Uh, we predict what we can't observe based on what we have observed in the past. That's a way to reduce uncertainty, make use of the concept, uh, and uh, get along with things more quickly. So let's talk about categorical induction. I wanna go through some of this pretty quickly. Um, because a lot of these uh, premises are the same, but what's gonna describe is two main ideas. Uh, one of them being induction based on similarity and the other one based on coverage. In other words, the relationship of categories to other categories. Uh, and then I wanna talk about uh, predictions based on conceptual similarity like coherence within a group. Uh, so we'll talk about generalization, similarity, uh, and these conceptual relationships. I said that I suggested that uh, all organisms show some degree of categorical thinking. Uh, organisms like uh, cats and dogs, uh, mice, rats, um, you know, worms, uh, insects. We all show, you know, this kind of generalization uh, to the degree to which it seems to be universal. If we take uh, a, uh, a rat, let's say, and this is one of these, you know, you learned about this probably in uh, Psych 1000, the uh, behaviorists uh, in the early 20th century would have been studying laws of learning and how organisms behave. And the sort of stereotypical or the uh, canonical example is the rat or the mouse in the box, right? And they press a lever or something, right? So the psychologist would present some information to them uh, whether it's a light or a sound or uh, colors, the animal has to behave in a certain way and the relationship between the stimulus and the response is strengthened in some cases or not strengthened in other cases. And we show how the animal can learn different behaviors as a response to its environment. Suppose we take a rat and we train it that when it sees the color red, uh, it presses the lever a certain number of times. It's got to press the lever 15 times and then some food pellets are dispensed. Uh, so the rat doesn't know anything at first. It's just wandering around, pressing levers, doing whatever it is. There's only one thing to do and that's to press the lever. Eventually food comes out. With time, it's going to learn that when red is shown and I press the lever a lot, I get food. If blue is shown or some other color or nothing is shown and I press the lever, nothing happens. So the rat eventually learns the only thing that matters in life is the color. And when the color is red, I press this lever and then my food is dispensed and everything is fine. Other colors are flashed or no color is flashed. I am not gonna waste my time pressing that lever because there's no relationship. Fine, it's learned a connection between one thing, red, and another thing, pressing the lever 15 times and getting my food pellet. Suppose we then show a color that is kind of like red, but not exactly. 
any rat, we all know exactly what the rat's gonna do. It's gonna press the button a while and maybe it's not gonna get the food, but it's gonna keep trying because it's close. In other words, it thinks, yeah, I'm not so sure about this one. This isn't exactly like what I saw before, but it's close enough. I'm gonna go ahead and press the lever uh, and I'll see what happens. And I'll press the lever, nothing's happening. Uh, it gives up. But it's not gonna press the lever very much when pink is shown uh, or when this sort of fuchsia is shown or when this kind of orange is shown. In other words, over a long period of time, it's gonna to tend to press the button when things are closest to the red that it was trained on. And it's gonna try out some things when the red is not so close and it's not gonna press the lever when things aren't close at all. In other words, it's formed a color category, a behavioral equivalence class around that shade of red or shade of red that it was originally trained on. And things that are similar to red get the same kind of response. The more like that original red you are, the closer the response actually is, the less like that red that you are, the less uh, response you're gonna get. In other words, the rat has learned to make categorical inductions. Sometimes things are exactly the same and it knows exactly what to do. Sometimes there's some ambiguity in the world um, and it behaves accordingly with maybe slightly less response. What it doesn't do, of course, is that assume, you know what, this is a Gru Emerald situation uh, and I'm not sure if I press the button 15 times and even though it's exactly red, maybe this is the day uh, when things switch. Uh, and so I'll, I, I'm not gonna bother pressing the button this time. Uh, it does not do that. It always makes this generalization. Uh, so we, we have this basic idea of stimulus generalization. We behave towards things and we behave towards things that are similar to the things that we've learned to behave towards in the past. All of us do it. All of us that are uh, sentient beings do this. So categorical induction is a way to think about um, how we use this basic idea of stimulus generalization and prediction when we're thinking about more complex arrangements. Um, in a categorical induction experiment or paradigm, uh, we're often asking people uh, to arrive at a statement of confidence that a conclusion category has a feature, which we'll call a predicate, after being told that one or more premise categories also have that feature. Uh, in other words, if example A has something and example B is kind of like example A, how likely is it to also have the same thing? Uh, and what we can explore then is how strongly we hold uh, different categories, how strongly we can uh, make inductions and predictions uh, from certain categories and the relationship between categories. Here's an example. This comes from Osherson and Smith's example. And we'll talk about their work in a few slides. Uh, and they developed the uh, similarity coverage model of induction. I talk about this in the textbook a, a good deal. And I'll, I'll talk about it for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, here's an example of a predicate. Boys use GABA as a neurotransmitter. Does anybody know what GABA is? It's a neurotransmitter. Uh, does anybody know what it does? I actually, okay. Like glutamate is like stimulating GABA is relaxing. I think so. I'm actually not 100% sure everything that GABA does, but yes. I guess it helps with anxiety. So there's an anxiety and a relaxation, uh, a sort of a, a satiation uh, component to it. Um, and are, are, is everybody confident exactly on the properties? Of, there's like a, uh, a supplement that some people can take, but the thing is they're still doing research. So, it's, so the, the point I wanna make is that we kind of have a sense that it, that it is an actual neurotransmitter. We kind of have a sense that it has some properties that are associated with neurotransmitters with uh, reducing anxiety, uh, maybe connects to serotonin, but we don't really know what it does, those of us here in this class, unless we are studying neurotransmitters. So it's what we're gonna refer to as a blank predicate. It's a blank predicate because it's plausible. There's information that we agree that we probably could, we don't know the answer to, um, but we think we could probably make some inferences if we're given some statements. So this is a statement. We don't know what GABA does, but we know that it's present in male brains. So I'll use the non-gendered term, but the uh, sort of sexual dimorphic uh, term. Let's assume uh, 
boys or young male humans uh, would use GABA as a neurotransmitter. Uh, perfectly fine, right? We can agree that that's a statement. We don't know much about GABA. We don't know much about neurotransmitters. Maybe we don't even know much about the difference between male, female brains, but this is a statement that we can do something with. And suppose somebody says, this is a fact, we know this is true. And then we say, therefore, girls, in other words, young female human uh, brains also use the same neurotransmitter, yes or no? How confident are you in making that prediction? Most of us would probably say yes, it's likely because we don't expect there to be differences uh, between male and female brains in uh, juvenile humans uh, in terms of the neurotransmitters uh, that they use. So if we know that this is true, we can, we can infer or induce that the second one is true as well. And that's a categorical induction. We don't know the answer. And this is the key thing. It's called a blank predicate because we don't absolutely know the answer from our own factual basis. You wouldn't necessarily have to have the information at hand. You wouldn't have to know because of your own study of neuroscience uh, whether or not this neurotransmitter is present uh, in different kinds of brains. All you would need to know is based on what you know about the category of uh, neurotransmitters and the category of uh, male humans and female humans uh, and their brains, what can you infer if being told that one kind of brain has this neurotransmitter, how likely is it that the other kind of brain has it? Uh, you're not retrieving the answer from basic uh, semantic memory. You're using your knowledge of the categories to arrive at a conclusion. That's what makes this a categorical induction problem. And that's what makes this a blank predicate. In other words, we don't know the answer from fact. We have to induce the answer or decide how likely the answer is based on categories. So the blank predicate, GABA as a neurotransmitter. Uh, another one here we're gonna talk about is a sesamoid bone. I'm gonna use this example in the next few slides. Does anybody know what a sesamoid bone is? That's good because that makes it a good blank predicate. If you know everything about sesamoid bone structure, what kind of animals have them and why, uh, then these are not induction problems, they're memory retrieval problems. Uh, this depends on you not knowing the answer uh, with certainty. Uh, this depends on uncertainty because that's when we use induction, when we don't know what to expect. If you already know the answer, uh, then you're not making a categorical induction. Uh, you're retrieving the information from semantic memory. So not knowing what a sesamoid bone is in the next example is critical. That makes it a blank predicate. That's why it's crucial. We need to demonstrate the relationship of one category to other categories and the way in which categories help us make predictions, the structure of your concepts and how that produces an induction as opposed to retrieval from semantic memory. This is sort of an induction hypothesis testing problem in and of itself. How close do I have to be to this to get it? There we go. I guess I have to be right here in the middle uh, in order to get it to advance. So this is referred to as similarity-based induction. Let's look at a series of premises and decide which conclusion is more likely. Um, similarity-based induction means that we make inductions based on how similar things are. Um, arguments are strong to the extent that the categories in the premises are similar. So if you're making an argument, you're making a categorical induction, and things in those categories are similar to each other, it's gonna be a strong inference. If they're not similar, it's gonna be a less strong inference because we like similarity. Similarity is what tells us how to, make predict how to make inferences and how to make predictions. So which one of these arguments seems stronger? Robins, it's over here, have sesamoid bones. So the robin has a sesamoid bone. Um, therefore, sparrows, I believe this is possibly a sparrow, not 100% sure, but I think it is, uh, also have sesamoid bones. Uh, so that's one argument. Because robins have it, we know that robins have it, how likely is it that the sparrow would have the sesamoid bone structure? The other argument, ostriches have sesamoid bones. Here's the ostrich down here. Um, therefore, sparrows have sesamoid bones. Uh, so which of these two seems like the stronger inference? 
I think we'd all agree that the robin sparrow seems like the stronger inference, right? Given that we don't know what a sesamoid bone is, uh, and given that we don't know what kind of bones robins, sparrows, and ostriches have, if you learn a new fact about robins, and then say, is it more likely to, is it, is it likely to be in a, in a sparrow? You'd probably say, yeah, probably, because I mean, look at them. They kind of look similar, right? They're both small. Uh, they both uh, live in the backyard. Uh, they're not the same bird. They eat different things, obviously, but given that robins and sparrows are typical birds, they're in the center, they're similar to lots of other birds. We assume that just because they share things that we can see, they probably also share features that we can't see. And that's the basis of an induction. That's a categorical induction. The ostrich, on the other hand, is an atypical, unusual bird by our standards, because we don't see them very often. They're the largest bird. They don't fly. Uh, they have particularly strong legs. So you could imagine a scenario where you think, well, a sesamoid bone is something the ostrich has because it's an ostrich, right? It's something about its bone structure because it's got to run. Uh, and it kicks things and it does things that are different. And because it's different in all these observable ways, it might be different in unobservable ways. And so the likelihood or the probability that the sparrow shares the same bone structure with the ostrich seems less good. So if asked to pick which one of these two relationships is more likely to be true, most of us, uh, and this is what Osherson and Smith found in their research, most people choose the robin sparrow pair over the ostrich sparrow pair. Uh, so if we're forced to choose between one of the two, we like this relationship. And their claim is that this is called similarity-based induction. We make inductions based on the similarity of one object to the other object. Yeah. Will the responses be like changed depending on the order of presentation of the contending groups? Yes. And that's a great example. So remember back when we talked about, so the question was, can people's preferences change based on how they're presented? Uh, yes, they can, because remember when we talked about similarity, uh, some of the problems with the geometric model is that when you make similarity comparisons, sometimes the order matters. Uh, we're going to show later on that sometimes the ordering can change your uh, what kind of relationship you expect. In some cases, you might see it as a similarity relationship. In other cases, you might see it as a causal relationship. Uh, so sometimes the order does matter. But as a general principle, uh, if we've got nothing else to go on, the similarity between two things is a really good one to go on, right? If things look a lot alike and they act a lot alike and they look a lot like everything else in their category, they share things that we can see, they probably share things we can't see. Um, I didn't, I, I bumped my microphone right at one of the words, sorry. I see, um, categorical, categorical induction, is it similar to like the transitive property in that sense? Yes, yes, so that's exactly what we're doing. So it's similar to a transitive property. We're taking what we know about something and transferring what we do know uh, to make uh, inductions or predictions about what we don't know. Uh, so that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we're taking this relationship that we can observe these things are in the same category. They're close to each other in the category. They're close in semantic space. They're close in conceptual space. They have properties that we can see. They probably also have properties that we can't see. Uh, and although we can agree that this might be a possible relationship, they're further away in the category. They're less similar. So they're less likely to have properties that transfer. Exactly. Um, so that's one example. The other example that's uh, the other key relationship is the idea of typicality or coverage. So I said there are two main things I wanted to hit, similarity and coverage. Coverage has to do with um, the degree to which one of these target uh, objects covers most of its category, right? So robins, we agree, are kind of a typical bird. Uh, they're kind of the prototypical bird in some ways. If I asked you to name a bird, probably Robin would be one of the first things you name. So it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's, like a, it's possibly a prototypical bird because it shares features with lots of other birds. It's at the center. Um, and if it shares things with lots of other birds and Sparrow is another bird, uh, that's one of the reasons why we might make that inference. In fact, which of these two arguments is stronger? Penguins have sesamoid bones and therefore all birds have sesamoid bones. That's one possible conclusion. Robins have it, therefore everything has it. Penguins have it, therefore all birds have it. Most of us are going to agree 
uh, that the Robin example is a stronger argument. Uh, robins share a lot of properties with most birds, not every bird, but with most birds. They're kind of a typical bird and typical by definition means that it shares lots of features with other members of its category. Penguin, by definition, is an atypical bird. It is a bird, but it doesn't share a lot of its key distinctive features with other, uh, with other birds, right? Uh, so it's kind of an outlier in the bird category. Something that's true of penguins, given how unusual they are, is less likely to be projected to the rest of the category. This is coverage because Robin is typical and therefore covers more of the category. If you imagine the entire array of birds, Robins are gonna be kind of in the middle and which true of bird, Robins will be true of a lot of other birds. In other words, if you know something about Robins, it pretty much covers most of your bird, useful bird knowledge. If you know something about penguins, it probably doesn't cover a lot of the other useful bird knowledge because what you probably know is true about penguins and not about true about the rest of the bird category. Does that seem clear? So we get similarity and coverage. And this is referred to as the, thankfully, as the similarity coverage model, uh, because it talks about the degree to which similarity drives our inductions and the, the degree to which coverage drives our inductions. Oshersen and colleagues suggest that induction is guided by the similarity of the premise category to the conclusion. In other words, how similar is the thing that I know to the thing that I don't know? Um, robins and sparrows, and the degree of coverage that the thing that I know about, the premise exemplar, has over the entire category that includes everything that I'm thinking about. So two slight, they're, they're, they're related ideas, but they're different. Uh, the degree to which what I know is similar to what I don't know, and the degree to which what I know covers the category that includes everything, including what I know about and what I don't know about. Does that seem clear? So similarity, two things, coverage, one covers everything. Uh, and the degree of coverage is also a predictor. Why are they both the same thing? There are some cases where they kind of diverge. Uh, so there are some cases where we can tell that coverage is really driving uh, the distinction and similarity is really driving the distinction. And this comes about with what's known as the diversity effect. The diversity effect, uh, on the surface seems like it would be counterintuitive because it suggests that things that are similar to each other actually might cover less of the category and therefore undermines the inductive inference. So the less similar two premises are to each other, the stronger the argument can be. Also remember premise conclusion, in that case, similarity means a stronger argument. But if two things are very similar to each other in the premises, they may cover less of the entire category. This can be shown with this sort of, this is kind of a, I mean, this example is not obviously very realistic, but you can get the idea. Which argument is stronger? Hippopotamus, so hippos, and hamsters. The hippopotamus is huge, right? It's the second largest land mammal. Uh, and the hamster is very small. No, uh, it's not. It's not the second smallest land. Is it a mammal? It's a mammal, right? They're. They give. They have live. They don't have eggs. I hope not. That would be creepy, actually. A hamster egg. Um, so they're little. Um, are they, what are they called? They're. Are they rodents. They're little rodents. Okay, fine. I, I guess I don't know anything about animals. Um, so hippos and hamsters. Let's suppose they love onions right? Uh, who doesn't? Uh, hippos and hamsters love onions. And let's just say, therefore, I mean, if, if the gigantic hippo loves this thing and the tiny little inconsequential hamster also loves this same thing, it's probably something that all mammals love because hippo to hamster covers a pretty broad swath of the, uh, um, the, the mammal category, doesn't it? I mean, that's a lot of mammals right there to go from hippo to hamster. Big coverage. Even though hippos and hamsters are very dissimilar from each other, one doesn't, you don't usually think of one in, next to the other, right? They're, you don't, they don't belong together. Now, suppose you are then told that hippos and rhinos, the hippo and the rhinoceros, which are not the same animal, but we often treat in the same conceptual space, right? Uh, they might, they're both large. Uh, they both uh, would live in similar environments, maybe. 
uh, maybe we both only ever experienced them if we saw them in captivity or at a, uh, in a, at a nature reserve uh, or in a zoo or something like that. So uh, we wouldn't necessarily see uh, the, the hippo and the rhino uh, in different environments. We might see them together. We might assume that there's the similarity to them. In other words, they're kind of like each other. You can make the same argument with the hamster and the guinea pig, let's say. So two little tiny uh, rodents. So we got two gigantic mammals here and they both love onions. How likely is it that all mammals love onions? What Osherson and Smith found in this diversity effect is that the more diverse the premises are, the more likely people are to endorse the conclusion category because it covers more of the category that includes everything that you're trying to make a, a conclusion about. You just have more diverse evidence, uh, more cases, right? If you can have a lot of diverse cases to make your argument, it's a stronger argument. If all of the cases to make your argument are really similar to each other, it's a less strong argument. It seems more contrived. In other words, it's more likely to be that large, enormous mammals have this one thing in common rather than all mammals. So diversity effect has greater coverage. Even though there's a high similarity here, it's not a similarity that we use when we're making inductions. Um, other things that come to mind. So a premise category that has little overlap with a conclusion category often ends up having no effect on the argument strength. So you can have non sequiturs in induction. Uh, if, things, if there's no reason to think that it provides additional evidence for your conclusion, then you might just ignore it. Um, a German shepherd and a giraffe has a sesamoid bone, therefore moles have sesamoid bones. Well, that's not a very strong uh, conclusion, right? But it does cover a fair amount uh, of the category. Um, if a German shepherd and a whale have sesamoid bones and you're then asked to conclude, how about the little tiny mole based on this huge coverage, uh, the suggestion here is that there are additional features uh, with the whale that undermines the diversity effect. Certainly this is what Osher said at Smith now. Uh, so diversity is important to a point. Uh, if diversity induces or in, involves additional features uh, or additional properties, like the whale, for example, being so much unlike the other uh, categories that uh, it's too diverse, people tend to ignore it uh, and it reduces the likelihood that they'll endorse uh, this conclusion. Uh, this is known as a feature exclusion effect. Uh, generally speaking, the more information we have, the stronger the arguments are. Um, so if we find out that uh, lots of different things uh, have a strong sternum, uh, so crows, peacocks, and robins, the more you have, the stronger evidence you have. Um, but again, if you include something that is really unlike the others, uh, it can reduce uh, the, uh, uh, the likelihood that you endorse that conclusion. So monotonicity refers to a monotonic relationship. More features, more premises, uh, more exemplars makes a stronger argument, but some relationships are non-monotonic because they induce or they uh, include information uh, that's not useful. Uh, in this case, crows and peacocks are members of one category, rabbit brings in an entirely different category. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it doesn't really have any bearing on what's true about all birds. Uh, it's an additional piece of information which kind of undermines uh, the original argument. So monotonic relationships are common, uh, but not exclusive. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about this one and I am keeping an eye on the time here. I realize we've got about 15 minutes left. I think we're gonna make it through the information. Um, I can sort of tell maybe that we've reached kind of maybe the point at which it's hard to pay attention to. And I don't mean that you all have, are having, a, it's just hard to pay attention to stuff for uh, three hours. Is that generally true? It's a three hour time period. That's a long time. Uh, that's a very long time. And I don't know if I would sit through a movie. I think I've made that comment before. So uh, it, I'll try to get through all of this. If anything seems unclear, I'm happy to talk about it next week. Uh, if there are aspects of this lecture which don't quite make sense, or if I ended up going through stuff too fast, uh, stop me and I can continue to question so I, or answer the question. So I don't want to get to the point where uh, I've just continued to talk and uh, it's not very interesting anymore. So if you need me to stop, 
by all means, just mention it. Um, but I think we're going to make it. Uh, it's 11.58. Uh, the inclusion fallacy, all robins have sesamoid bones. Therefore, all birds have sesamoid bones. That seems like a reasonable conclusion, right? We've already discussed that. Robins are typical. They're in the center of the category. If they have something that's unseen, we can, we can conclude or induce that other birds will have it. So we already agree that's a good categorical induction. We can also suggest uh, that adding additional information here uh, about a specific conclusion can undermine it. So all robins have sesamoid bones, agree. Therefore, all ostriches have sesamoid bones. Now, Osherson and Smith, when they've tested this with their subjects, uh, found that people prefer the first argument over the second argument. How many of you would agree that the first argument seems like a better conclusion? If you had to choose, it seems better. Why does it seem better? And then why is that wrong? The prototypical model we talked about. Yeah, exactly. So it seems better because this is the similarity coverage idea going on. This is a, an item that covers a lot of the category. Why is this a fallacy? So we use similarity relations. That much we know from the similarity coverage model. But they also describe this as an inclusion fallacy. So what's wrong with the conclusion? Um, because saying that like, uh, like an ostrich is a part of all birds, and so those two statements should technically be like the same or equivalent. Yeah. But we don't treat them as the same because when we say all birds, we're thinking of all the ones that are the most similar to robins, whereas like also just like the least similar to a robin. Out yeah. Of birds. So people tend to be like, eh, yes, all birds, but maybe not an ostrich. So that's that's and that's a good that's a good description. Um, exactly. So when we hear all birds, we think like all real birds, right? Let's be honest, ostrich is not a real bird. Okay. Uh, so what we're saying is, yes, all birds. And then we say all ostriches. Ah, yeah, I don't know about that. I'm not sure I agree with all ostriches. That's a fallacy because all birds includes all ostriches. If we're willing to say yes here, we have to be equally willing to say yes here. And you can see how this is related to the conjunction fallacy that we talked about in the first half, right? In other words, we overgeneralize these similarity relationships. Uh, and ignore some of the categorical relationships. So categories, the categories drive our inductions, but not exclusively. Uh, we sometimes stretch the boundaries of these categories uh, to say that when we mean all birds, we actually didn't mean all birds, we just meant all birds like robins uh, and not all the birds, uh, because we agree that this is an awkward way to frame a relationship. If we wanna conclude something about ostriches, we wouldn't start with saying, well, all robins have this, so therefore all ostriches have it too, um, even though it's included here. So it's an inclusion fallacy. Uh, we ignore category inclusion and we base our uh, inductions, our inferences on this similarity relationship uh, that we described earlier. Let's talk about how other ways in which this similarity coverage model falls short. Uh, sometimes we actually know something about the causal structure. Uh, we know something about the causal relationships. Um, for example, uh, suppose uh, we're given this uh, relationship. Cats, your average house cat, can have a parasite. I don't know what it's called. Parasite X. So cats sometimes have parasite X. Field mice also have parasite X. So a little tiny mice outside. And therefore, all mammals have parasite X. Um, that's one argument. Cats have it, field mice have it. How likely is it that all mammals have it? It's one argument. Um, the other argument is uh, cats have it, tigers have it, and all mammals have it. Which of these two seems like the better way to make the case that all mammals have it? The second one. Uh, the second one seems to fly counter to the uh, diversity effect, right? Because they're actually less diverse. And why would that be? Well, I feel like it's kind of the opposite because a cat and a tiger are both part of like the feline family. Yeah. But so like we, we think that cats and tigers are more different than cats and field mice because they're found in like different areas of the world. Yeah. Like, I don't know, evolutionarily speaking, they're probably more similar than cats and field mice. Yes. So 
the first one should actually be better. The first one should be better. You're exactly right. And according to the diversity effect, um, the first one should be the stronger uh, relationship. But you can make a case for this one being stronger if you understand this within the uh, realm of causality. Uh, so only under that circumstance uh, does the cat tiger seem like the stronger argument for all mammals. And you're exactly right. This is a conflict between the similarity coverage model and this diversity effect, which should predict cats and mice having it being a stronger argument because that covers more of the mammal category uh, versus cats and tigers. Yes, they're different sizes, but I mean, it, those of you that love cats as much as I do, you realize that almost all cats, they all act like cats, right? I mean, even tigers act a lot like house cats. I mean, they have some of the same behaviors. So you would kind of imagine that these things uh, should be less similar or it should be more similar and therefore a less strong argument. But the argument is that people prefer the second argument here because there might be a causal link. In other words, if the cats, the house cats are catching the parasite from field mice that they're hunting, uh, then that could be an explanation for the parasite. It's not something that's common to all animals or mammals. It's something that's just common to your average backyard field mouse and your average backyard cat. Uh, that's where the relationship happens. So it's exclusive to this causal relationship. When viewed within this causal lens, this seems like a less good argument. When not viewed within the causal lens, the preference can reverse. Uh, and again, these, for a lot of these, there's no right answer. Uh, we're just talking about preferences. Um, there's an asymmetry, and you would, someone had asked the question earlier about the question order. I think you had asked the question about uh, when you ask these in different orders, does it change? And sometimes it does if one of them highlights the causal link. Um, so switching the premise and conclusion categories will reduce the strength of the argument if a causal path exists. Uh, for example, gazelles contain a chemical called retinum. Let's say that's, we know that to be a fact. And then we're told that lions also contain this chemical retinum, right? It's something that's common, it's found, it's a property that's found, it's an element or a chemical or uh, a feature that's found in both gazelles and lions. People find this one to be stronger than this one, even though they are the same products, uh, the same retinum, the same gazelle, the same lion, People think this one is stronger. Why do you think the first one is stronger? Well, it's because the, it highlights a potential mechanism, right? If gazelles have it first, and then we find out that lions have it, it tells us one reasons why lions may get this chemical. They get it from hunting and eating and consuming the gazelle, which has the retinum, and therefore uh, the lion has it also. Highlights a causal link. It tells us why they have it. Uh, this one does not highlight the causal link in the same way. If we find out that lions have it first and then gazelles contain it, um, it doesn't highlight the causal relationship. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just doesn't highlight the causal relationship. So the, uh, the asymmetry here is that the order in which they're asked about, the order in which they're presented, one of them highlights a causal path. The other one does not highlight the causal path. And this suggests that we in addition to um, similarity and coverage, we also make inductions based on perceived causality. Okay, last topic, and we are gonna finish on time now, because this is, this is kind of the last one that we're gonna talk about, is category coherence. Uh, this goes back to the idea we talked about at the beginning of the class. I suggested that things like uh, feminist, or accountant or playing jazz for a hobby might have different levels of coherence. And that as a rule, we tend to prefer coherent categories when we're making inductions. Uh, if everything in a category is alike, everything we know about the category, if it's a tightly held together category, if it's meaningful, shares a lot of features, when we find out that someone is a member or something is a member of that tightly controlled category, we assume that other things about it are gonna be true too, right? Uh, and that's why individuals in Kahneman and Tversky's experiment uh, tended to think that Linda, with all of these other features, might also be a feminist, even so much so that they ignored 
the conjunction and they made a conjunction fallacy because that connection was so strong. The coherence of feminist and the coherence of Linda's other uh, features was higher than the perceived coherence of bank teller. Uh, bank teller didn't seem to have much coherence in that case. Um, inductions are made from concepts and categories on the basis of similarity, but the coherence of the similarity plays a role. We've talked about the example of police officer. Uh, that's a fairly coherent category for most of us. In other words, we assume that people go into law enforcement may share some similar values. They have similar backgrounds and training. Uh, they have uniforms that are similar. They're deployed in certain ways. It's a coherent category. And if I find out that someone, uh, you know, a meeting, if I meet someone and they say, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm in the OPP. I would say, okay, well, that's a coherent category. I don't know anything else about you, but I might be able to predict some things based on my perception that that's a coherent category. If somebody says, I am a, a financial analyst, uh, that might be a less coherent category. It's not a, an, an incoherent category, but maybe one of them seems more tightly connected. Uh, maybe one of them seems uh, a little bit uh, stronger coherence. Maybe elementary school teacher, less coherence. Uh, so some categories vary in their coherence per these sort of occupational categories. We expect there to be a high degree of similarity among people who join the police force, and we might expect them to share features, traits, and behavior. So we might feel more confident making predictions because they're in that category. Restaurant uh, waiter or server might seem less coherent. Uh, probably some of you, uh, even like I did when I was uh, an undergraduate, uh, have worked in restaurant food service, right? Uh, it's not a particularly coherent category. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the category. Uh, it just means that lots of people uh, can, for a time, be restaurant servers uh, or work uh, in a kitchen. Uh, it's a common enough job that doesn't necessarily have that kind of same coherence that maybe police officer does. In fact, you can make a really good living uh, serving in a high-end restaurant, right? Uh, it's a, maybe not quite as much as an OPP officer on uh, overtime, but you could still make a really good living. If it's a good restaurant, you get a lot of shifts, uh, you're picking up a lot of tips, you maybe work some vacation time, it's a good job, right? They could both be good jobs, but one of them might be more coherent than the other. We would expect less overlap among the people compared to police officer. There's probably more diversity in this category and more possible reasons why people would have the job. So if we find out that someone is a member of an inco or a less coherent category and a more coherent category, which one should we reason from? Which one is going to be more likely uh, to drive our intuitions. It's going to be the more coherent category because we assume that those are more likely to have correlated features. Uh, and this is work that was carried out by Andrea Patilano, uh and some of her colleagues. They looked at, uh, there's a copy of this paper, though I'm not asking you to read the paper in great detail, but it's a really interesting and well-written paper that talks about the coherence of social and demographic and occupational categories. Catalano, Chin, Parker, and Ross uh, looked at social occupational categories that were higher and lower coherence. And they studied these categories quite a lot uh, to come up with a measure for how coherent they are. And categories that had what they referred to as a high entitativity. In other words, when people hear uh, soldier, feminist supporter, and minister, uh, are they likely to make a lot of features, come up with a lot of features, or have a good sense of what that category is like? Um, and the answer is yes, those categories seem to be tightly connected. People are alike in those categories. However, some very low coherence category like matchbook collector. Um, I mean, I kind of would almost argue that's a coherent category because like who collects matchbooks? It's gotta be like only one kind of person. But anyway, they found that people who would be described as someone who collects matchbooks, like the kind you might get at restaurants and bars that have the name of the hotel on them or something, Suppose you collect those all over the world. Anybody could do that, right? There isn't anything particularly coherent about that category. A county, it's a county, not country, a county clerk, a limousine driver, and so on. So they compared what they found to be high coherent categories with low coherent categories, and then gave people premises. Uh, carried out an induction task in which people were asked to make predictions about people who were members of more than one category. For example, 80% of feminist supporters prefer Coca-Cola to Pepsi. 
That's one premise. 80% of waiters prefer, prefer Pepsi to Coke. And there's no reason to believe that one or the other would be true, right? But suppose you're given this information. Uh, and then Chris is a feminist supporter and a waiter. Um, and what beverage does Chris prefer? So given these two possibilities, which seems more likely? Uh, is Chris more likely uh, to line up with the other feminists and prefer a Coke or line up with the other waiters and prefer Pepsi? And what they found over most of their uh, studies um, is that uh, people preferred to make inductions about the more coherent categories. In other words, Chris is more likely to prefer Coke because people view some of these categories as being more coherent. And this provides a possible explanation uh, for the conjunction fallacy that we talked about earlier in the class. In other words, categories drive our inductions. Uh, the similarity relationships within a category drive inductions. And the degree to which we view a category, especially a social or an occupational category, as being a coherent, meaningful unit, one that belongs together for a reason, we're more likely to make inductions for those because most of us know people that are in multiple categories. We ourselves are in more than one category. Right now, you're a, a Western student, right? Because you're taking a course on campus at Western University, but you're not just a Western student. You belong to lots of other categories simultaneously. Uh, some of them might be coherent. Some of them might be less coherent. Uh, and when you find out that someone is a member of one of these coherent categories, that's what you're gonna to prefer to make predictions about. So when you show a representativeness effect, it's gonna be stronger for these coherent categories. So does that seem clear? I wanna, I thought I had one more slide coming, but that was an abrupt end. <laughs> I was like, so, okay, uh, actually there's no more content. Um, before I hit this last slide, did that all seem clear? I think I thought I had another slide coming, but I guess I didn't. Um, it was kind of a, it was a coherent lecture, wasn't it? I would say in the coherence argument that this lecture had a fairly good coherence. Uh, we make inductions based on our backgrounds. Uh, we tend to prefer things that are grouped tightly together. Uh, induction shouldn't work, but when it does work, it has to be categorical and has to be driven by highly similar uh, coherent categories. Okay, coming up, we've got a few things. Uh, we have on March 15th, which is two weeks from now, uh, an online quiz. Quizzes will stay online regardless of what happens. I see no reason to believe that we will not stay in person. Uh, there might be some ups and downs with COVID cases, but I think as the weather gets nicer, we all know what happens. Uh, we're more likely to just be outside and things should uh, be more uh, like we expect them to be. So we'll continue to have these in-person lectures. I'll continue to live stream them just because it's convenient and easy. Um, and the next two quizzes, quiz two and quiz three, both in March, uh, will appear online just as they did before. The final exam is no longer TBA. We think it's almost certainly going to be April 10th. And as soon as I know for sure, officially, I will update the calendar and the course outline accordingly. Coming up, we've got deductive reasoning uh, and context motivation and mood. So our next quiz is gonna be all about induction and deduction. Uh, then we'll talk about some other uh, ideas, context, motivation, mood, and cognitive biases, decision-making, problem-solving and creativity and expertise. Lots of great topics coming up. All of this information from induction and inference on down is gonna appear on this uh, second exam. All right, have a good week, everyone. And I'll see you back here on March 8th.